Welcome to Raptors Weekly for the week of June the 29th. Uh, it's the draft podcast, the post-draft podcast. And to make sure we got enough draft expertise on here, we've called in the man from the Dr. Zinn, Steve Gennaro. Steve, welcome to the pod, man. Uh, I, I'm excited to get the call, Zarar, after uh, last week's pod when you said I knew nothing about the draft. I wasn't sure if I was going to get it, but I'm happy to uh, to see that uh, you've, you've trusted back in my knowledge again, so happy to be here. Well, trust is a strong word because you did call uh, <laughs> Steph Curry a bust when you got drafted, so uh, let's, not, let's not forget that. <laughs> uh, also joining us is uh, Andrew Thompson, the regular on the pod. Hey, man. Hey, what's going on? Nothing much. Uh, let's let's get to talking. Uh, let's start with Vasquez because that was the first night, the first move of the night uh, on uh, on draft night. So just a little preview to that. So Vasquez uh, in a in a press conference a couple of days back said some teams were interested in him, and the next day uh, Masai Ujiri said, well, Vasquez says a lot of things, and the next day Vasquez gets traded. Uh, so Andrew, your thoughts on uh, what happened with uh, with Vasquez there? Uh, was it was it something that you think his comments caused the issue, or was this kind of predetermined? Um, I, I think that his comments getting published in a, uh, a Spanish language paper probably had a lot to do with the fact that he's been talking about this and complaining a lot about this uh, for a while now. And I think that management was probably not so much that the straw that brought the camels back was him talking to a newspaper so much as it was that they knew that he'd been complaining and, uh, and upset with his role with the team for a while. And I think they realized that between the contract number, what they could get for him, and the fact that it's not ideal for the team chemistry or for what you're trying to build on a second unit to have someone who's displeased with their role. Uh, I think this was had him see his way out of town. What was his complaints about his role, though? Like, what did he, like, enough minutes? What was the issue? Uh, minutes, he wanted to play more minutes, and he wanted to be more, uh, play a bigger role. Um, there's a lot of back and forth, nothing substantiated, but uh, people talking on Twitter saying, like, reporters, uh, Butch Carter tweeted at uh, Will Lou saying that at um, the CIS championships last year that, um, that Vasquez was telling anyone who would listen to him that he was really upset about his role and not playing more of an offensive offensive role. Yeah. Steve, were you sad to see Vasquez go or is he, is he one of your, uh, you know, um, uh, hate boys? <laughs> Uh, I don't, I'm not happy to see him stay. I'm not really happy to see him go. I'm quite indifferent, actually, to Vasquez uh, in in either role. I thought it was a pretty good deal, actually, from Saigeri. We'll probably talk about that in a minute. But it makes sense, right? There's too many cooks back there. If you're going to keep, um, you know, Lowry, if you're going to keep Williams, uh, you know, Vasquez, you just can't keep having all these guys uh, playing in your backcourt, Ross, who you know, who all want to jack up the ball and take lots of shots, but all who aren't defensively accountable. So, you know, so- someone, at least one of those four, had to go, and I. I'm hoping that two will go and maybe even three of them will be gone before we get to September. Hmm. So with Vasquez's exit, there's no backup point guard. And uh, midway through this, this uh, the draft, this trade happened around the 10th pick or so. And so at that point, you kind of knew the Raptors were looking at point guards. And there were a few point guards available uh, when the Raptors did select, but they went with uh, DeLon Wright, the guy actually I wanted the Raptors to draft just solely because he's a 6'6 guard. And Masai Ujiri loves those. He gave Julian Stone like two chances because of his height. Uh, he's known to play defense. Uh, he's, he's a good ball handler. Uh, his shooting leaves a lot to be desired. But but Steve, let's start with you on this one. What are your thoughts on the player itself right now? Were you were you happy with the, with the selection? Okay, so maybe we can do this two ways. Uh, the first way is we, we can talk about DeLon Wright as a player, and then we can talk about the selection of DeLon Wright, because I think they're two, sort of two different things. It, I, have, I have different points of view of, of views on though on them. As the player, I think DeLon Wright's a good player. Obviously, you mentioned his size. He's 6'6". Six, six. Uh, you mentioned his wingspan, you know, 6'8 wingspan, 8'6 uh, reach. So there's lots of things to like there about him. Uh, you know, is, is he going to transition well to the NBA? Yeah, uh, probably, because uh, you know, he's a solid defender, has good athleticism. Uh, he's a senior, so he has you know he's, has some aging experience. On the downside, he's 23 already, uh, and uh, although he has a good steal, you know he gets a lot of steals and he can rebound well. He's a good passer. He's not a very a strong shooter, especially from distance. But on the whole, like yeah, as far as drafting backup point guards go, yeah, this is a you know who, who wouldn't want a player like Delon Wright as their backup point guard? I think that he can. Uh, play a role on this team and be helpful. So th- all of that, you know, makes sense. So, you know, is he a good selection for uh, in and around the 20th pick? That seems to be where most uh, mock drafts had him ranked. So the Raptors certainly weren't reaching for taking him at number 20. Uh, and I, you can see how he, if he fills in, as Chad Ford called him, as Vasquez's replacement, then, hey, he meets a need for the team. So in all of those sense, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, a job well done. 
But am I happy with the pick? Uh, no, I'm less than thrilled with the pick. I think there's a lot of, uh, and we could talk about this if you want to. I think there are a lot of uh, better choices that the Raptors could have made than selecting Delon Wright with the number 20 pick. Well, well, well let, let's get to those selections in a bit, Andrew. What, what do you think of Steve's uh, comments here? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. We're talking about the 20, 20th pick in the draft. I'm not sure how much better we're going to get of the guys. I I think that we, they might be personal favorites, but I have a hard time believing that there's someone that we passed on that we're going to really, really regret. Um, I just I don't see that kind of being what what the guys that went after him were. And I think that you know, like Dylan Wright, he's not, it's not just that he's a good defender. Like he was, according to some measurements, the best perimeter defender in college basketball last year. He was fierce. Uh, Synergy Sports has him holding opponents to point z- or zero point four five points per possession whenever he was guarding them. But like that's that's preposterous for a guy who played a lot of minutes guarding the other team's best players. This is a guy who has the potential to be like a Patrick Beverly style point guard, someone who can just absolutely lock down opposing guys. Steve, rebuttal on that one. <laughs> well, uh, the, the only rebuttal that I would say is, you know, um, if sorry about that. If you want, if you want, if you want to take it in context, here's how here I would take it. Um, is he the best perimeter defender in college basketball? No, um, he wasn't last year. So, if it did the Raptors take the best available defensive talent at 20, the answer is no. The best available defensive player at 20 was Hollis Jefferson, who many Raptors fans wanted. I'm not saying that's who I would have selected, but if the argument is that they picked the best defensive player who can contribute immediately to this team in the team's biggest hole, uh, that's actually Hollis Jefferson. I, yeah. I think it's best defensive point guard. Nobody's saying best yeah. defensive player though. Okay, well, if we're talking about um, on on the wings, though, as well, right? So if we're talking about now the best point guard in the draft, he wasn't the best point guard available at that position. Uh, at number 20, Ty Jones from, from Duke was the best available a, a point guard who was still available at 20. Now, I know I saw lots of people on Twitter putting out that Jay Billis had tweeted that um, – that he thought, or people are tweeting out that, that that Jay Billis had said that DeLon Wright is the best senior point guard available in the draft, and the Raptors, no, he didn't say the Raptors got a steal, but they were using that as the legitimation, the legitimation of their argument that, uh, you know, there was a big steal here for, um, you know, for the Raptors by getting him in that point. But just a couple of days earlier in his mock draft with Chad Ford, Jay Billis, when, uh, you know, didn't, he, he did, when, the first point guard that he selected after the 20th pick uh, was Ty Jones, and he, he didn't select DeLon Wright until several picks later. So when he had the chance to draft them both in his own mock drafts, he didn't take uh, DeLon Wright over Ty Jones. And the difference is that Ty Jones, although he's not longer, he's not taller, he's just, he's a better talent. So DeLon Wright wasn't the best point guard available. He wasn't the de- best defensive player available. He wasn't the best talent available at that point. The, the most talented player available at that point is probably Bobby Portis. If you just rank players into tiers, like as, like, as to tiers of talent, DeLon Wright's probably in the third tier of guys in the draft, which is sort of where you would find some of the other guys like you know Jones or Jefferson or uh, Harold, or not even Harold would be there, but you know some of the other guys that you hear, Max, like um, uh, Looney might be there, or Hunter, or Vaughn, or uh, you know um, Jerry and Grant, you know uh, some of these other guys that will be in that same sort of talent tier. So it's not like he's in a bad tier of talent; he's a good tier of talent. But Portis is in, a, in would probably fall into the second tier of talent, at least in my opinion, and you know I think most scouts would probably agree with that assessment. So he's not even the, he's not the most talented player available. wasn't the best point guard available. wasn't the best defensive player available, and he wasn't even the best value available at that pick. If you think about drafting like the San Antonio model or the Golden State model or the New England model from football, where you try and get the, the highest possible value return for whatever pick you get. Yeah, but at that but at that point in the draft, Steve uh, and Andrew, jump in any time. Is that is it about is it really about getting the BPA best player available, or is it at that point about filling a particular team need? And the Raptors, after trading Vasquez, had a glaring hole at point guard. I, I'm not convinced it's still fixed, but at least they addressed it to some degree. Yeah, and I mean, it also depends on how many roster spots you have available, and you've got projects, guys who are projects at certain wing positions already, when Bruno and and uh, and the guys from last year, and you're looking at, you know, who are you gonna, if you're going to take someone who's going to be a project but might have a high soon, like, do you have a the the ability to develop them, and b do you have a role for them to grow into? Is that going to be somewhere like the best player available? isn't always the best possible thing to do, even when you're looking. I mean, look at Philadelphia; they're not exactly thrilled about having three big men right now. And there's a lot of people very concerned about that. So best player available and the whole idea of trusting the process and just getting assets is something that I think is a really interesting perspective. But I don't think that we've seen that that's definitely the way to go yet. 
Uh, I, would, yeah. I would say two things to that if I can, though. The first is uh, best value available at the pick. Uh, you know, three picks later – or sorry, four picks later at 24, Cleveland picks Ty Jones, but then they swap him for both the first and the sixth pick in the second round from Minnesota. That's two picks, two unguaranteed contracts, so you don't have to guarantee the money like you have to for the number 20 pick. And then in that – you know, with that – you know, in the – was that 31 and 36 or whatever that is, you have the opportunity then to, to fill some of those needs and take some of those chances. There's still lots of talent available in that space as well. So I think there are other, other – decision you could have made. The other thing I was going to say is with the 20th pick, there was talent on the board and I understand the idea of filling the, the need of the backup point guard, especially after you trade Vasquez, but I have, I have a hard time believing that this team, which is going into free agency, with, two, with, the need, with needing two starters, okay, at least two starters, uh, you know, that their biggest hole, their biggest need is the backup point guard. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's, it's the need that can be most filled by looking at the draft. I, I don't know if you're going to draft a starter in the draft. I don't think that happens other than, other than the top five picks maybe. But yeah, I mean, you know, the reality, I, I, like, yeah. all these guys, these names that we're throwing around right now of this, the eight or nine guys we're mentioning, the, the reality is five or six of them are probably not going to be in the league in, in three years. Hmm. All these guys that we're excited about or think might be better. And maybe Dylan Wright's one of them. But guys drafted between 18 and 30, like half of them are not going to be in the league in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. And the and the point about the age, the twenty three years old, Steve, you kind of painted this as a negative, but I, I, I'm I'm actually excited about getting a senior, so we don't have to invest so much upfront development time uh, in a player. So I'm kind of excited that he's got four years of college experience. He's playing the, one of the most responsible positions on the court in point guard. So I'm I, I look at the four years experience, the twenty three years of age, as a huge positive for the Raptors, not not necessarily as a negative. Yeah, if you listen to the pod, which I know you have because you listened to all of them two, three times. But like, you know, uh, for for everybody else, if you listen, if you've ever listened to the doctors in, you know that I'm a big fan of actually drafting seniors. I think it's a really sound idea uh, for, for for to to draft seniors, especially the things like the point guard position. The only downside to that is um, if you think about where he is as an offensive player, you know, to to be that far along already in in your age and in your career without having developed a consistent shot or a consistent shot from range can be seen as a, as a downside to a point guard uh, in, in particular. You know, coming into the league without the ability to shoot the two or the three with any consistency. Yeah, I'm going to make a Vince Carter comparison here, and forgive me for this one, but when when Vince came to uh, you know came to the NBA, he didn't have a jumper, but he had good form, and he developed that form and became a fantastic jump shooter, and that was his like primary game, like you know, five years into his career. I'm not saying DeLon Wright's going to become a great jump shooter, but he's got decent form, and Dwayne Casey talked about in his in his. Uh, you know, post press conference and the draft that you know it's about repetitions with the guy. If you know, if he takes two, three thousand shots a day, he's got a good form where he can build and get a jumper eventually. And a lot of times, players don't get jumpers in college because of their role or the system they play. And now I haven't seen much of Utah, granted, but I just think that it's one of those things which practice can get you a jumper uh, because the form is already there, and it's a question of coaching and dedication. And uh, I'm not too worried about the jumper aspect, Andrew. Yeah, there's a lot of point guards that come into the league without a jumper. Uh, Lowry was really not known as a shooter. He actually had a – not nearly as tall, but he came into the league as a defender, a good ball handler, a crafty pick-and-roll type player who could maybe develop a shot, and that's what he turned into. I'm going to disagree with both those points. The first one on Vince, I'll tell you, you know, Vince was actually a, a, uh, uh, an offensively very sound and at times dominant player in college in North Carolina. I think the better comparison for Vince would be someone like D'Angelo Russell, where there were some concerns about what he could or couldn't do, but he basically dominated through the tournament in, 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 his, in, his, in his final year before going pro, where you saw that there's upside and there's scoring ability, but, uh, you know, uh, but, but then could it translate to the next level? I think that's probably the better comparison. For the Lowry one, you know, the, often uh, at, at Villa, they like to play the two guards. And they, 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 so, so Lowry often played off the ball as well uh, as, as, a, as a second, as a shooter or as a scorer. I think the better comparable, though, for, for if we want to look at the positive in the upside of right, uh, and again, this is also taking into consideration a shooter shooting, I think, is Rondo. I think Rondo's a really good comparison for who DeLon Wright could be. Like if we say, okay, what's, what's his ceiling? What's his best comparable? I think Rondo's a really good comparable for that again you know would it can delon right become rondo yes and if he does will that be fantastic for the raptors obviously and will messiah become a genius for, for making that pick yeah you know but and so the, the talent is there that's why i said at the beginning i like the player there's a lot about the player to like my concern about the pick is you know was it the best pick for this team and the, and the truth is I'll, I'll say this and andrew you, you know you guys you guys can hold me accountable to this you know we don't know the we don't know the end result of how good or bad this pick will be a lot of it will be what happens next now how does he fill the other holes for the team because if we get some good moves in free agency if he shores up the three and the four really 
nicely during free agency, then yes, this was the biggest hole in addressing it. With 20 was the, was the right pick to make at that point in time. But DeLon Wright is certainly a talent, but uh, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be a lights-out shooter anytime down the road. That's not uh, that's just not sort of part of uh, of his game. But he has other great skills, you know. Well, I don't think you're looking for him to be a lights out shooter. I think when someone brings the other elements of the game to the table, you're looking at someone to become a competent shooter. Like if he can get up to shooting, you know, 34% from three for a backup point guard, maybe starting point guard at some point. But regardless, if he's if he can control the ball, if he can work the pick and roll, play really, really good defense and still at least just knock down open looks, that that's all you need him to be. You don't need him to be 40% from three. You just need him to be competent. Yeah, but you know, if, if we go back and look at it, if you go back and look at his game log from last year at Virginia, you know, um, uh, he, he rarely, not rarely, I would say, uh, rarely is probably the wrong word, but it's not very often that he takes, uh, you know, he he hits ten field goals. Uh, so it's just it's not that's not the offensive game that he plays. He's really in he, he's he's sort of a five to six field goal a game uh, type of player, and that's even with him starting and playing, you know, um, you know, thirty five minutes a game for that squad. So yeah, know, but that, yeah, but that's exactly the guy you need, Steve. You don't need a guy who's used to dominating the ball in college it, on a Raptors team where you have a lot of people who need the ball in DeRozan, Lowry, Valanchunas. You don't want a guy who needs field goal attempts to survive. You want a guy who can get by with a bare minimum. Sure, as long as he hits them. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. The other, the, the, my only con- again, a, another concern to put out there, just for Raptors fans, about and just, again, Jeez, just how a, many concerns does this guy have about him? Okay, continue. I, 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 <laughs> like, but I do, right? But I yeah, do yeah. because right away the media comes out about he's going to be the defensive stopper. This is the guy we're looking for. He, he's he's going to guard the opposing team's best point guards, and the Raptors can really yeah. count on him to, sh- to shore up that spot as the backup point guard. But we also know that Dwayne Casey has a real has a real um, problem. Uh, pro- yeah, problem. He has a real problem with starting rookies or playing rookies significant minutes. So how so how many mm-hmm. core minutes down in, in, in key stretches of the game is our defensive stopper DeLon Wright going to be on on the court? And if he's not on the court for his defensive stoppage ability, like I I, I want to see him succeed, and I see all the things that are there for him to succeed. I'm just not sure that he's going to plug right into the wrappers in the way that everyone's hoping he's going to. And I just want to point that out. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure who who you're talking about who's saying that he's going to be the ultimate defensive stopper and going to be guarding the other team's best point guards. I think he's going to be guarding the other team's backup point guards. I think that's. I think the guy guarding the other team's point guard is probably going to be Lowry. I, I don't. I, I'm not really sure who's driving the narrative that this is all of a sudden our Tony Allen who's going to be playing 30 minutes a game. I think. <laughs> I well, I, I hope. I, yeah, I hope not. He's going to be playing off the bench, guarding the backup point guard, and hopefully, hopefully, finding a way to be con- competent to you know replacement level above replacement level uh, quality by mid-season towards the end of the year. I think is what you're hoping for him. Yeah, but the, the, I'm speaking more to the Twitter response to the draft pick, but and also to the idea that you know Dwayne Casey likes to uh, down the stretch in games play two guards. We've seen it uh, many times. We see Lowry and Vasquez together, or you know whether it be Lowry and the Williams before that, or Lowry and Salmons. He he likes to have the idea of two different guys who can handle the ball on the court down the uh, down the stretch. And if he is going to be Vasquez's replacement, we saw Vasquez play a lot of important minutes uh, down the stretch of, of of key games. And I'm not sure that Delon Wright can translate or can transfer directly into that role. I hope he can. But you know, and that, it'd, be, it'd be amazing for the rappers if he if he's able to do so, and if, especially if Casey trusts him to do so, uh, that that would be great for the team. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good point about Casey. Is that like if you look at his track record, you know how he's dealt with Valanciunas and Ross, it hasn't been the best. Uh, it leaves a lot to be desired. So now you got another rookie coming in, Andrew, who who you've asked Wayne Casey to develop and maybe in a big role as a backup point guard. So that that's probably a big risk of of, of uh, Delon Wright's development in his, in his early couple of years. It is. I think that the pick is also, in some ways, to me, suggested uh, uh, like a, an element of faith from the front office in Dwayne Casey when he was really excited about this pick. And uh, the reporting has been that this is who he wanted, you know, like a large, defensive-minded point guard who's a senior in college, someone who's ready to play, someone who's more of a veteran-style defense-first mentality that really vibes with what Dwayne Casey idealistically is, I think, strives for. And I think that. This is perhaps them giving him a little bit of a nod and saying, like, let's try to build the team that you feel like you can do best. And maybe part of the problem is that we've been giving you pieces that don't fit with how you want to coach. So if we're deciding that you are going to be the coach, then how can we work with you in order to have that style of play be what we see? Mm -hmm. Uh, Hopefully that means that he has a little bit more faith and a little bit more trust and and willingness to let his picks develop, especially as rookies. But I mean, we'll see because you guys are right. Like that, that is the, the MO for Dwayne Casey. So we got to talk about the second guy we drafted. So in the Vasquez trade, we acquired a future first, which is protected for the first couple of years. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but we have a future first round pick, but also we get a second round pick for the, for the this year's draft. And we got normal Powell, Norman Powell from UCLA. <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> I call him Norman. Norman Powell from UCLA. And Steve, you're a UCLA alum. So how much have you seen of this guy, and what can you tell us about him? Okay, well, um, you think that I'd be very excited about this pick, and you know, I, I am. I'm always happy when UCLA guys come to uh, Toronto. Uh, but again, I, I'm not sure how much you're going to get from him, Raptors fans. I think you can probably expect him to spend some time in the D, uh, you know, playing for the 905. Um, but what, what can I say? He, you know, he's actually shorter. Okay, he's 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 shorter in height than right. He's only six four, but he has a longer wingspan. He has a six eleven wingspan. And an mm. eight and an eight seven reach. So if you talk about a future backcourt, let's say five years down, let's say five years down the road, the Raptors are able to develop both of these players into legitimate NBA starters, and then they are able to develop Bruno as that as that three. You're talking about a point guard, a two guard, and a three who all have basically seven foot wingspans and who are supposed to be you know, be athletic enough to be solid defenders. So that is you know an interesting uh, side point to uh, Powell. Again, there's some concerns here about his ability to shoot the three. So if you're trying to get, if you're drafting guys who can give you D and three, uh, you're only getting the D from Powell and uh, and, and and from Wright. Uh, you know, Powell can defend. He's, he's he's got a bit of chunk to him, so he you know uh, hopefully that will disappear in the weight room. He shoots the two really well, though. He's been a, he's been a solid uh, scorer for UCLA, especially in the last two seasons. He's a true senior, uh, unlike Wright. Uh, Powell played all four seasons at UCLA, so uh, he's he, he never redshirted. He played it all. He played all four seasons, and as he played each of the four seasons, his not only did his minutes improve, but his role in the offense improved. So, uh, especially in in last season, the 2014 2015 season, he was the primary offensive piece for that UCLA team, uh, um, in, in part because. He had to be because uh, because of injuries to, to other key players, uh, but also because you know his his ability to to score uh, effectively uh, you know from from basically 18 feet in. So uh, which which is nice to see from from a two guard. He will drive. He will stick. He will stick twos, and he does that well. Uh, the downside to him is he doesn't really have anything else to his game. He doesn't shoot the three well. He's not a very sound rebounder for, uh, for you know he he, he had five, almost five rebounds a game last year for UCLA, but that's a bit of an aberration. Like it wasn't actually in line with the type of player that he was or the rest of his career. Uh, he's not a great passer as far as like setting up other players and you know and defensively um, his long wingspan leads to a lot of steals and so he helps to break up a lot of plays in transition uh, and he's decent on on the man but UCLA's defensive schemes make it really difficult to assess the defensive success of a player when they move on to the next level so uh, at whatever 40 something where they drafted him is he a good picture at 46 you're basically throwing darts uh, he has many skills that translate to the NBA level uh, but I'm not sure you'll see him on the Raptors roster this year, or if you'll maybe if, if he'll ever stick as a Raptors player. Hmm. Well, I, I don't have the analysis that uh, Steve has, but I just know Andrew that just by looking at him, he's got a bit of Ben Gordon to him. All right, I'm agreed. I agree. A cosign. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've seen a more than a five minutes of uh, uh, Powell play, and that's only like I just went back and uh, checked out some YouTube videos. And uh, but for the YouTube videos, all they show is highlights, so it's hard to judge. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's very yeah, difficult. Yeah. Not a lot of turnovers on the uh, no. Draft Express videos. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's it for the draft. Uh, we'll take a quick break and come back with some DeMar, DeMar DeRozan contract talk and sign some more. Welcome back to part two of Raptors Weekly. In this section, we're going to talk about DeMar DeRozan a little bit. DeMar DeRozan... Um, uh, a report came out uh, this week that a co- uh, that his camp, whatever that means, I'm guessing his agent, uh, is looking for a, a max deal for DeMar DeRozan uh, starting next year, starting next summer. Uh, that's when the cap goes up to about $108 million. And uh, it had a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of kind of pissed off and saying, trade this bum or trade this guy right now because uh, he's not deserved uh, of the max. And uh, I kind of looked at the numbers a little closer. And right now he's making about, like, say, 16% of the cap. And uh, if he does make $25.3 million, uh, you know, next season when the cap does go up, uh, he'll be making about 24% of the cap. So, Andrew, is that... To me, it didn't seem like a big deal because once you look at it in relative terms and not absolute ones, is this like a sign that – like, are you comfortable playing DeMar DeRozan that kind of money? Um, look, I think DeMar is someone who's demonstrated an ability to keep working on his game and improving his game year after year after year. So if he can develop an actual three-pointer, if he can have a reliable three-point shot, then he is a max-level player. I mean the, just – I think that that's not – I don't think that's all too controversial. But we have seen no evidence of him being able to do that. 
So if you're a shooting guard who lives in the mid-range and can't shoot threes, then no, it's not reasonable for you to demand the max or to, to command the max and ever be on a team that it's, that comes anything close to contention. But, you know, so that's the question is before next summer comes around, do we see whether or not he's capable of doing that? Um, and I mean, I, I don't know why there's controversy about his camp looking for the max. I think everyone's agent should be looking for the max on behalf of their player. Like I'm looking for the max too. I'm not going to get it, but I mean, anyone who's up in arms about that is like, look, like wait and see approach here. I don't know why we need to be upset about this or wanting to be get rid of him because I think every player is looking to get the most they can possibly get. It's not like that means that they don't understand themselves or how dare they. Like it's a business negotiation. Yeah. It's like one of the things is that $25 million in today's cap makes him the highest paid player in the league. And, but the cap's and, about to explode. Exactly. So, so, so fans look at it from uh, in the current cap perspective. But once you look at it in the, in the new world, uh, things appear a little differently. Uh, Steve, your thoughts on uh, DeRozan as a player? And can he develop a three-point shot? Like, is that he's, – he's entering year seven right now. Do you think he's got it in him to, like, up his game to actually get a three-point shot? Not just get one, but get one where he's shooting, like, 37% or something like that? I hope not. I'd actually like to see him go in the other direction. I'd like to see DeMar DeRozan just be more aggressive to, uh, attacking the basket. I don't want him further away from the basket. I want him closer to the basket. I think he's at his best when he's aggressive, when he puts the ball on the floor, and when he drives towards the net. We see that in his free throw numbers. We see that in his shooting percentages. The closer he gets to the basket, the more successful he is, as with most players who aren't Steph Curry. And so, you know, I would just like to, I'd like to see him um, take, the, for me, the next step for DeMar DeRozan to becoming a max player is, is taking over games on a consistent basis by being the dominant aggressive uh, you know uh, player offensively where he just drives to the hole and when he does that he he is an elite level player in, in the NBA and he in you've already spoken to his ability to take the next steps he's continued to grow as a player there's every reason to believe that he will continue to grow into this role where he becomes a max player I guess but you know what's a max player in the NBA I don't know there was a time when Jamal Mashburn was a max player and when everybody every team in the NBA had at least one guy who was their max guy but if Jamal Mashburn was your one guy you weren't winning titles then we went through this phase where not everybody, every team has a max player. Only max players were like the elite players who were really max. And then some teams had multiple max players. I just, I, what the new NBA looks like financially, I don't know. I don't care too much about who makes how much money unless it affects the other players that you can bring in. So if DeMar DeRozan making $23 million means that he has to be the guy in our team and we can't bring other pieces around him to be successful, then I think he's not worth it. But if the cap moves in a way where paying DeMar 23 still allows us to keep, let's say, Lowry and Jonas and bring in maybe somebody – in the free agent market with, with some of the cap space that we're going to have and be able to push and contend, then, then really I, I don't really care what those numbers look like. It doesn't bother me. What matters is you know, can, we, can we fit other players around him to be successful and will he continue to grow to be a dominant type player, which, which he can be? I mean they, the, the idea of what he's making, like the max means a, percentage, a certain percentage of the cap. So if he's making the max, it is absolutely going to affect our ability to bring in other players. That's, that's the reality of max contracts in – in a salary cap league, especially if you're trying to sign guys at a free agency, we are not able to go over the luxury tax limit without re-signing. Um, I, I don't know if it's mutually exclusive. I think it's a false idea to say, think it's mutually exclusive for him to be able to develop a three-point shot and maintain or improve his aggressiveness. I think that those two things can go hand in hand because it really would change the way that defenders are, are forced to play him. They can't sit back. They can't bring early help if he can shoot a three-pointer because – it, I mean, it's totally opening up the driving lane for him and, and changing the way the defender is sitting on him. So I think that him improving a three-point shot makes it a lot easier for him to then drive and be aggressive. That's a good point. The, my, my concern about that, though, is that if, if, if we're, uh, we're going to have him to taking three-point shots, it means the ball's going to be going into his hands maybe earlier in the shot clock, but it, like, uh, above the elbow. And I, I don't want him that far away from the basket when he gets the ball in his hands. I want him to be in a position where he gets it and can aggressively uh, take it. I want, him, I want him closer to the basket uh, where, where, where his first touch comes on the ball. Okay, but I mean, like, the amount of, of inside the the elbow post-ups that DeMar had per game last year are really low. Like, we're talking about a very small percentage of plays. He's getting the ball on the perimeter right now and trying to work his way into a mid-range jump shot. I mean, the bulk of his offense is a mid-range jump shot. That's where he's taking the bulk of his shots. And he's not hitting a lot of them. He's hitting, like, 38%. If he can hit 37%, 36% just by moving a few feet back to the three-point line, he's increasing his points per possession exponentially. He's a much, much better scorer if he's taking threes instead of mid-range games. And then even, like, I'm totally fine with him taking more shots at the basket. I think that's what everyone wants. But it's really difficult to get him in there. And I don't think we've seen him as a post-up player. His post-up game is more 
of like a like a 12 to 14 foot turnaround jump shot post up rather than a traditional one. Yeah, I agree with everything you're saying as well. You know, on 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 both those points, it's, it's actually a, a, both are really good points that you make there. For me, the issue is that the way in which the offense is set up is a stagnant offense, where our best players, our most creative players with the ball, aren't getting aren't aren't receiving the ball on their first touch uh, in areas where they can be successful. And to me, that goes just back to the playbook, to Dwayne Casey, the types of plays he's been drawing up for this offense. And it's one of the reasons why when playoff basketball comes around and where a team actually gets to scout you and play night in and night out, we're seeing we're seeing our teams really you know have a lot of difficulty being successful. And I think that putting DeMar DeRozan in more successful spaces will, uh, will, will allow him again to attack the basket with more veracity and, and really just you know and, and take his game to the next level. But sure, adding a three-point shot, of course, will help his game. Uh, my, my concern is you know sometimes when players like that develop the shot, then they become not more reliant, but they just become more passive. You know, we definitely saw this again going back to Vince, who's where I was talking about earlier in the podcast. We saw this with Vince as his shot improved, his desire to attack the rim, you know, uh, d- disappeared. <laughs> And then his dominance as a player also tended to move along with that as well. Yeah, so the, the way I look at DeMar DeRozan is that not, not in terms of salary, but in terms of tiers. Like if you look at the NBA tiers right now, tier one might be LeBron, Curry, James Harden. You could classify that as tier one players. Tier Sorry, can we, can we, no, can we just stop with Le, LeBron is tier one. Tier two can be all the other guys you named, but tier one is LeBron. All right, fine. Then in that case, the next tier would be Blake Griffin, LaMarcus Aldridge, maybe Kevin Love. Uh, you know, throw, throw your throw your Dwayne Wade. I don't know, like these kind of players. And I think Demar Derozan is a level below those players. So when I yeah. when, when when I look at Demar Derozan, where I want him to be to to account for twenty five percent of the cap, twenty seven percent of the cap, I want him to be a tier two player at the very least. And I don't think right now he's that. He's definitely a tier three or tier four player, depending on how Steve wants to classify it. And he's got to make that next jump. And Andrew earlier talked about the incremental inc- improvements he's made every summer, how he's gotten better. He has, man, but it's been it's been very small increments. A little bit of ball handling, a little bit of jump shooting, a little bit of defense. It, he really hasn't taken a big step. Like he hasn't come out of one summer and said, yeah, I'm the dominant guy or I've improved this part of my game by a huge degree. I just haven't seen that. I and, mean, did you ever expect him to be where he is now in his rookie season, though? Like has he already – has he exceeded your expectations in that regard? See, this is no. I, I don't think no. he has. I, I think no, this is what I, I, I kind of right. wanted him. This is where I where I kind of projected him to be in the best case so far. Uh, but I want more than that. Like for for him to command twenty eight percent off the cap, I want him to be at the same level as say impact wise as Blake Griffin or Lamarcus Aldridge. And right now he's not that. And if I had to put my money on it of him making that jump, you know, I I would say no. I I, I don't know if he can. I don't know if he can do that. I don't know. That's just me, though. I, he, he's not going to get the max. There's, I can't foresee anyone in the NBA who would be willing. I mean, it only takes one asshole, as the saying goes. But <laughs> I can't. I just can't see anyone who would be willing to give him that kind of money when he he had just does not have like with the way the game's going, him not having a three point shot, with him not being able to impose his will on anyone in two different rounds of the playoffs now, with him really struggling to to carry a team. I think. I mean. There are like, – look, look, Vivek Randive is still running the Sacramento Kings. Like, they, Maybe they're the one team who would do something like that, but I I just can't imagine who would be willing to give him that percentage of the cap. So I think if the Raptors are going to keep that, him, like the, the bidding war, I can't, I can't imagine it being anywhere near a max contract. So next logical question is do you trade him? Because if you don't trade him, you've got to sign him to an extension. And uh, if you don't sign him to an extension, you don't trade him, then you enter a Chris Boss situation. So just f- first question, do we want a Chris Boss situation here where he enters the final year of his deal without a contract and the media every day or every other week is like, OK, he hasn't signed. What's he going to do? What's, d- do you want that at all, Steve? I, I think that if you don't sign him to an extension, uh, there won't be the media circus that there was for previous players because his player option is so the the 2016 player option that he has at whatever nine and a half or ten million dollars is so ridiculously cheap that there is no way he, he 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 takes the option. Now he may opt out and then re-sign with Toronto, but there's no scenario by which he's 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 going to opt in at that point. So I don't think we'll be having those same discussions. Now, would I sign him to the extension? Uh, no, I wouldn't. For be, uh, but I would have, I would have already moved on from from this core of Lowry, DeRozan. Uh, I don't. I, in my mind, 
the current setup of this particular club uh, as it, as we see it today isn't going to take us to the next level. But having said that, Masai Ujiri has a lot of cap space this summer. You know, who does he go out and add as the next piece? You know, DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry are really nice pieces, but they're but they need they they need an alpha dog in here who can who can take over when when they need to win a series. And I don't think either one of those guys are that guy. So I wouldn't resign DeMar DeRozan to that money. But if I had another player on my roster and DeMar's my second gun or my third gun, then and I can afford it because you know then then so be it. Andrew, like, De- Demar is not going to sign an extension. Like it, it, it makes absolutely no sense for him to do that right now because the cap is going to make a giant leap next summer and another one the summer after that. So, no, I mean, even if he has a down season, just by opting out at the end of this year and then signing a contract next summer, because the salary cap is going to go up so much, he's going to make a lot more money regardless of how this year goes for him if he signs a contract next year than if he does it right now based on the realities of the cap. So he's going to play this season out, and he's one. I mean, he's definitely going to opt out of his player deal. So we're, we are going into the season with him going to be a free agent at the end of the next year, probably, almost definitely. Do, do you um, do you aggressively look to trade him then this summer? I, I think it. I think it needs to be value respective. I think that I'm not. Of all the players we've ever had in Toronto, I would be the least worried about Demar leaving. He seems to be a guy who actually really likes being here. Who who sort of really buys into the idea of the culture of the team and is okay and wants to make this son of his team. So as far as guys like Bosch and Vince, like I think we knew when those guys' contracts were coming up, like they, they, we can we can hope, but but they're gone. Uh, whereas Demar, I don't feel like that is is the case. So I think if you shop him, if you you don't make the trade unless you get value, because I think that. You know, if someone offers you something that is a deal that makes sense, then I think he's 100% tradable. But I don't think that there's any rush to make that happen. Mm. I, I agree. I think that's a great point. You shop them around. You see what the with, uh, with every player, you should be doing that. Seeing what the options are in the off season. See who likes them and what they're willing to what they're willing to pay for them. And especially when there are teams who are looking to make big bold splashes, either pre draft, post draft, or because they 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 don't get the free agent that they're looking for, and they have to do something for their fan base. I would definitely shop Demar Derozan. But I really like the point that you make. It's not about selling him away for nothing. You know, he's he is an asset to this team, and he's a core part of this team. And Every player should be made available if there's a better option out there. But if there's not, then there's no rush to to move him because you know there's all there is always next year. You have him under contract, you know, for 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 a whole other season still. So now the draft is over. Uh, the Raptors have uh, kind of solved their point guard position at least, uh, you know, too deep. So what's the next major move here, uh, Andrew? Let's start with you. Like uh, free agency starts uh, July first. Uh, what's what's Ujiri looking to do uh, given uh, given the hand he's shown so far this season? Uh, we need shooting and we need we need forwards. So too bad Nick Batum uh, got traded, eh? Yeah, that would, I mean, especially for what they they paid for him too. That's er, that that was the guy that both Will and I were were really on wanting here, and um, it, it's certainly too bad that we weren't able to put together an offer that would have made that happen. But you know, we need we need anyone who can shoot threes reliably, and especially if they have the size to guard multiple wing positions. And we need uh, a playmaking or shooting style power forward, I think. So that can be the same person in, in certain circumstances. But I think we need three or four different guys. And I think they should all be able to play either the three, the four, or shoot threes. Mm. Steve? Yeah, you know, I'm surprised that we didn't try uh, in the draft to address our two biggest holes, which are, as Andrew just pointed out, at the three and at the four. Um, I, I thought that if at least a, one of the picks should be focused in there, and I thought if there's an opportunity to, to make a deal to either uh, pick up a veteran at, on draft day or to move down and pick up multiple picks to address one of those or even move up and, and get, a, get a, a potential starter. Uh, so I'm surprised that none of those were dealt with. Uh, I put out on Twitter today at the Real PhD Steve a list of uh, big men that if I was the rappers i would be looking aggressively to try and pursue you know lamarcus aldridge obviously is the top of that list i don't i don't, I don't think he's coming but you, at least now you have the money because of the vasquez deal to be in that discussion but guys like greg monroe uh, deandre jordan paul Millsap, uh, i think those are all you know uh, guys that you could throw real money at who, who could come here and would make a huge impact immediately to this team uh, I, I also like tyson chandler which i talked about on a previous uh, pod coming in here i think brandon bass could be bought at a reasonable price who could be helpful yeah uh, that's the one i didn't get the brandon bass one 
Well, my idea is this, right? If you're going to throw max money, you, have to, you, you got money to throw at one, uh, at one player. So if you don't throw it at, at a big man like that, I like the idea of throwing money at Jimmy Butler, like real money that the Bulls can't match. Because not, uh, not only does it hurt the Bulls, but it also, uh, you know, it also allows you to improve your team. And if you're going to go after a guy like Jimmy Butler and you throw all that money there, you still need to address the four. And I think Bass is just a solid uh, player who can shore up your shore up your roster and, and and play significant minutes at the four, but not cost you a lot of money. I mean, the, the Jimmy Butler thing, it doesn't matter what money, amount of money any team puts on that offer sheet. Like, like Chicago is matching that. Yes and no. Like, yeah, yes, of course. It, make, it, it would be crazy for them to let, to, to let him walk. But the type of uh, cap hell they'll put themselves into, if, 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 they, if, if a team comes around and says, okay, we're giving $16 million to Jimmy Butler, like, that's, like, Chicago has a lot of money right now <laughs> sitting in a lot of players that, the, that, you know, they can't just divest themselves of that easily. It's not like they can they're just gonna say, okay, well, that, let's just, you know, that's the end of Derrick Rose or, or Pau Gasol. Yeah, like, they're not losing you know, Jimmy Butler. There's no way they're letting man. Jimmy yeah. Butler go because, like, a, like a young, young, great player like Jimmy Butler go because they're worried about paying for two seasons of Pau Gasol at 37 years old. Like, that's not a cost benefit analysis decision they're gonna make. Like, there's the, but the only way that Jimmy Butler is not in Chicago in two years is. If he just refuses to sign, he does a Greg Monroe move and doesn't sign anything. He just takes a one-year qualifying offer and tries to move towards unrestricted free agency in a year. Otherwise, he's either going to be signed, signing an offer sheet in Chicago will match it, or he's going to be signing a long-term extension there. Those are the only yeah, but, three outcomes. And, and for that. Like, the, the same thing applies to Demar Derozan here. Like, why, why would uh, Jimmy Butler sign an extension at this point? Like, like he, maybe he will take the one-year deal. Like, maybe that's what makes most yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, the, the the reason why you take a if he's actually going to get a max extension, the reason why you take that is because in the event that you know, like this year really goes poorly for you, or you have a like you you rupture your Achilles or something like that, then you're really affecting the amount of money you can make in the long term. So yeah, but but, take, I, but I think we he's shown that by declining the earlier contract offer that he's willing to do that. So I don't I don't see why he wouldn't just repeat that again. No, I, I do. I think that's what he will do. I think he's gambling on himself, and hopefully he stays healthy because if he does, then it's going to pay dividends for him. Yeah, and, and as for the Brandon Bastock, I, we, the Raptors have about thirty-six million dollars in cap space right now. Once they renounce their uh, Lou Williams and Amir Johnson, uh, I just don't see them, uh, you know, throwing that money at somebody like Brandon Bass when you have Patrick Patterson, who's kind of similar player, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, Patterson has uh, more range than Bass. Yeah. Uh, but nice list though, Steve's at the real PhD, Steve. So, so you t- so tell me then. You tell me who are, who are the rappers buying with that money then? Well, the guy that I liked on your list, and I've been talking about him for a while, is Paul Millsap. Uh, if if the if the Hawks don't want him, or or he doesn't want the Hawks, uh, throw him all the money you can and get him here because he's a reasonable target. Like he's he's a type of guy that's in that tier two that I kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, and if you if he if he's on the Raptors, he automatically becomes arguably their best player. And that's the kind of move you want to see made, where Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan are not the two best players. They're somebody else. And granted, he's not better by a huge amount, but he's still a capable forward who can take you a long way, as shown last year. So I'm happy with that money being thrown at Paul Millsap. Uh, not so much Tyson Chandler. Uh, not so much Brandon Bass. I'm just looking at your risk, uh, your list here. Greg Monroe, no. We have JV, and Monroe's a terrible defender. And Aldridge ain't coming here, so it's, it's a moot point yeah. to talk about that. Okay, on, on the idea of Millsap, though, is uh, are you then looking to pair him up with someone like DeMar Carroll, like go into Atlanta and take to take their two best players away because they're both available this summer. Well, yeah, I don't. We're, we're not going to be able to make that happen contract wise. Those guys are going to be develop, are commanding a lot of money, and the amount of cap space, like the space that we have available, I don't think is going to be able to fit both of those players. Considering like the amount we're under the cap is not the same amount as the amount that you're allowed to spend because you're signing other players. Yeah, like uh, just fitting in just the amount of guys to fill out the 15 man roster. I don't think we're going to like Demari Carroll is is looking for like 13, 14 million dollars a year, and Paul Millsap's going to get about 15, 16 probably. So, yeah, but you, you got to sign some other players too, right? I mean, we we have like we, exactly. we, don't, we don't need just those two players. We need like probably three more after those two. So you got to save money for those two. So uh, I, I just I see the Raptors having enough space to throw big money at one guy yes. and respectable contracts at, say, two, three guys, not not necessarily two huge contracts at two guys. 
that's yeah. why I put that's why I put Chandler and Bass on that list. Not because I thought that they were big guys, but I thought that they were guys that you could come in and, and play significant minutes, but that would not cost you a significant amount of money if you decided to put your money into the wing position to shore that up. Yeah, but didn't you hear Dwayne Casey's comments that the role of the center is uh, days gone by now? It's, it's not happening anymore. Well, Draymond Dray, Draymond Green is a restricted free agent. You could always make a make a run at at, at uh, Draymond. You know, the thing with these with the restricted free agent offers is like I, teams are just not going to do them probably because. Like Chicago is going to match the Jimmy Butler thing, and Golden State is going to match wh- whatever anyone offers Draymond. And the problem is when you make an offer sheet to those guys. Let's say we offer Draymond Green fifteen million dollars. Now, the Golden State Warriors have I think it's three days to match, and during those three days, we have sixteen million dollars committed. We can't sign anyone else, so that's all the players that are going off the board. While you're just waiting to find out that you don't actually get Draymond Green, like it's a really like all the people talking about, let's make an offer to this restricted free agent. Unless you feel really confident about getting that guy, it's really problematic in tying your hands as to what you can do during that period. It, only makes, you, it means you only, miss out on almost everyone else. Only if you expect the market to move quickly. And in a summer like this one, where there are a lot of players who are available, it's not a small free agent market. You know, the, I, I'm not sure it's going to move as quickly as, as as previous years. It's not like you're tying your money up and making an offer to LeBron so you can't make an offer at Mello. I don't think it's like that. I think there's one or two bigger guys at the top, and they're going to take their time, and they're going to go and see three or four different teams or five different teams. And while those teams are looking at that player, every Everybody else is waiting because teams are waiting to see where Aldridge goes before they decide if they're going to make a run at, let's say, Cantor or Marc Gasol or whoever else. Like these guys, you know, those there's going to be a, there's always a tiered movement to free agency, except for the year when you have, you know, like LeBron and and Wade and Melo and and Bosh, and you can't put your money in everywhere type of thing. You know, so I, I think it, I think you can actually, if you're early and if you're quick and if you isolate right away, this is a person we want to put our money into in the very first day. I think you can actually throw your money at someone and let it sit for the first couple of days of free agency because I don't think that many players will move immediately. I mean, like I, I, I straight up disagree with you, but my, the point is like it, it's moot. It doesn't matter. Like you're, no one is getting Jimmy Butler. No one is getting Draymond Green. So it's like you're taking a risk and there's like a 99% chance that there is absolutely no reward. So it's just it doesn't make any sense. What about what about Tobias Harris? What about Enos Cantor? What about like, you know, are you saying that like all the restricted free agents? No, are- I'm, I'm talking about Draymond and and Jimmy Butler. Like like those. I'm just saying like those are pipe dreams. Those are names that it's like it's fun to throw out. It's like ah, oh, what if we got that guy? It's like but we're not. So okay, what, like, what about what about be a free agent too? Why don't we make him a max offer? What about Chris Middleton? Like I, I, I yeah, I'm, th- th- those are all guys I'm that not, I did sign me up for it. Sign me up for Chris cool. Middleton. I'm just saying like those guys are not gonna. If you know that the other team is gonna match, then it's but, not. The, the thing with restricted free agents is you never know what the other team's going to do. You I mean, don't know. You, you don't. You know. You don't know what the number yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know about those two. About, about, about yeah. those two cases, though, Steve. Like I, I'm with you on Tobias Harris. I'm with you on Chris Middleton. I, I think those are two guys who the Raptors could really use. And we've talked about those two in the pod before, especially Middleton uh, and and Harris. We've talked about them extensively. I'd say, uh, yeah, th- give them an offer sheet and uh, go for it because you got a higher chance of uh, that materializing. But Jimmy Butler and Draymond Green's not happening. I I, I agree. They 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 they, they it's. Ex- Extreme, but in both those cases, in both the Golden State and the Chicago case, both those teams are pushed so hard up against the cap that there might be like there, there. The only way you know is when you you put the pen to paper, and if you put fifteen or sixteen or seventeen million dollars on a piece of paper, the player is going to sign it, right? And then the question is, is the other team going going to? match it that and and like we we can sit here and speculate that it is or it's never going to happen but you know we we're not the owner of the team we don't have to cut that check and we don't know what the point is where they say you know what i don't really need that guy we have a good enough team without him and we and we'll make do we'll take that money and put it elsewhere like all right all right fair enough so so, so let's talk about uh an actual free agent target uh supposedly today david aldridge came with a report uh and said the raptors might be meeting with uh al farouk amenu who played uh for the dallas mavericks last year before that he was the Pelicans and he signed a two-year deal and he opted out of a $1.1 million uh, contract that uh, that's what he would have gotten paid next year, but he opted out. Uh, He's a defensive-minded guy, a good rebounder, good defender, really can't shoot. Kind of reminds you of James Johnson, Andrew. Uh, So what's the rationale behind going after a guy like uh, uh, Farouk Aminu? Well, I mean, like, Shooting wise, he's like James Johnson, but he does not. He can't create offense for himself, and he can't create offense for others. He scores off of cuts to the basket. He scores off of fast break points. He scores when you know he he occasionally will be a screener in a pick and roll, and they'll double the ball handler and then get the ball. Like that's this is the guy who is scoring because he dunks. Um, he, he he's a really good energy 
energy player defender off the bench that can play the three or the four for you. But the problem is you can never play a guy like that large minutes with DeMar DeRozan because neither yeah. of them can shoot and your offense will just crawl to a halt if you try to play those two guys at the same time for long periods of time. Hmm. So I think it's interesting. I think that it's going to depend on the money. I think it looked in the first round like Al Farouk Aminu made a lot of money for himself by playing really well. And then I think we saw guys like Jay Crowder and guys like Damari Carroll and a bunch of other large sort of combo two, three, four type guys who can defend and have size step up as well. And that may have flooded the market. That may have mean that Aminu is not going to get the kind of money that he was looking for. So it, it's all about value here. If if you bring him in to play the three, four off the bench and to play defense and hustle and get some fast break buckets and it's a reasonable contract, then he's absolutely someone you want on your team. But you're not going to be giving him – seven eight nine million dollars and expecting him to play as a starter yeah. at least not with DeRozan yeah Steve so uh, you know given the Raptors offense stagnant iso heavy uh, you add a guy like Amino in there who can't shoot he's basically you know slowing it down even further and just making it look even uglier uh, besides that any any additional thoughts on this uh, on this player when I'm playing daily fantasy on FanDuel <laughs> with the guys for the World Wide Route Table, which you can play against us all next season, uh, follow me on Twitter and then follow after, at Raptors Republic for the links. Uh, when I'm playing daily fantasy on on, uh, on FanDuel, he's a great buy because you know, he's he's really cheap and you can get him on the cheap and he can you know uh, stuff the different stat boxes for you, uh, provided that you know the regular starters aren't available to play for health uh, related reasons. Other than that, you know I think the the point Andrew makes is perfect, right? At the at a really cheap price he, he can be a player of good value but you know eight million nine million anything like that that's just ridiculous money to play for a, a player like him when you've already said Zarrar, we have a guy like james johnson who does that already for us who, who can't find minutes in important playoff games already yeah if you have you... something like three years 15 million especially with the cap going up that that, that like that's something you're perfectly tolerable with yeah that's value that's that, that, uh, that's a perfectly uh, you know a good idea that's value that's value for the, for the player he's going to give you minutes at a, at a value-based contract that makes sense mm. Yeah, I, I just think that uh, you got a guy in here, a guy like him on the team, uh, he's here to collect missed rebounds. Uh, so that means <laughs> that that's what he's here for, really. Uh, so the Raptors probably need to have a lot of, a lot of good three-point shooting on the team for us to make sense to ha- sign a guy like Aminu. Because uh, if, if you don't have a spaced offense where your court is spread and you're taking a lot of good perimeter shots good spaced out shots. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have a guy like this. Uh, given the current offense, it makes no sense to get him. But if you're going to change it up a little bit, it's going to be more fluid. It's going to be more like the season before last. You're taking good threes and making them. Yeah, then it makes a lot of sense. You could even play good, play some pick and roll like you did with uh, in Dallas uh, here and there. Uh, you know, He basically rebounded Nowitzki's misses all season long. So uh, if, if he can play that kind of role here, sure, why not? But in the current offense, no, no, no thanks, man. No. And I mean, like, give him credit. Like, he, he cannot shoot, but what he's done instead is he's, I mean, he's a fast break machine. Like, he can turn steals into buckets. He gets out there and he runs hard. And he, if you can get turnovers, he can help you make those into easy baskets. And he's really gotten a lot better at cutting to the basket and recognizing when guys are just playing completely off of him. And when they turn and they turn their back to him, he's finding lanes to cut to the basket for, for layups. And that's how you make up for being a bad shooter. But that means that you're able to survive offensively with him on the court while you're playing great defense and rebounding. And hopefully you don't have to do that for more than, you know, 18 to 20 minutes a game because that's all you really want him playing, I think. Well, I've got good news for you. Um, if he just takes a thousand shots a day, he can improve on that. <laughs> a nice one. Uh, so let's round off the discussion by uh, Steve. Are you going to go to Miss Saga to watch the Raptors 905 and uh, Bruno Caballo a few games a year? Season tickets, man. All right. So they released the logo today. It was leaked. Uh, it's on the site. Uh, have you guys had a chance to look at it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah it's neat. Yeah. It's neat? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's better than the actual Raptors logo, the new one. <laughs> I'm, hope, I'm hoping that this uh, leads to actually a rebranding of the Toronto franchise to, to, to calling it, you know, like 416 or, or the 6 or something like that. I think that that would be actually really uh, – I think it's it's, a, it's more appropriate and more in line with the type of branding that they want for the franchise, mm-hmm. and I think it would go really well with the with the sort of the 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 the, um, the, the minor league team or the D league team being the 905, and then the you know the big city team being the the 416. So you're very much into area codes and uh, numerical systems. Yeah, eh? yeah. I think it's re- it's really reflective of the idea that 
I mean, it's a D league team. It's not going to be marketed across. Like it's, it's strictly marketed for the local audience. And that's why the nine Oh five is in the title because unlike when you're making an NBA team and you're hoping to have fans across, you know, across Canada, across the United States, across the world, hopefully like you're accepting that it's a D league team. And the only people who are going to give two issues about it are the ones that live within driving distance of the game. So why not make it nine Oh five? Why not make it feel like it's theirs? Right. All right. I think that uh, has concluded the podcast. Uh, good luck to the Raptors 905. I'm certainly going to go down there, check out some uh, DeAndre yeah. Daniels and uh, Normal Powell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with that, thanks, guys. It was a late podcast, uh, you know, midnight here almost. We're going to publish this in the morning. Hey, thanks for joining us, Steve. Cheers. Uh, Andrew, thanks again. Good talking to you, fellas. Later, guys. Later, guys.